Welcome everyone. My name is Agnes and I work with the education team at Libria Tar Pits. We want to start with acknowledging that the Natural History Museums of LA County are located on and work within the traditional homelands of the Indigenous communities that include the Tongva, Tataviam, Chumash and neighbouring Indigenous communities. As a cultural and educational institution, we honour our ongoing connection to these communities, past, present and future. We're so glad to have you with us this afternoon as we continue our three-part Ice Age journey to explore the treasures of the vanished world of Ice Age giants and the science of how these treasures connect to our understanding of past ecosystems, current issues of climate change, and all the questions we are still trying to answer. We'll hear from scientists from the Yukon Beringia Interpretive Centre and Libya Tar Pits, two of the world's leading sites for Ice Age fossils, as we dig deeper into the Ice Age. To view live closed captions in English and Spanish, please click on the external link we have dropped in the chat. For our guests watching on YouTube, the link to closed captions in English and Spanish is in the video description below. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hi everyone, and my name is Keisha, and I'm part of the team here at the Yukon Beringia Interpretive Center here at the Yukon. Before I introduce you to the rest of our crew today, I would like to acknowledge that the Beringia Center is located within the traditional territories of the Kwanlun Dun First Nation and the An Kachan Council. We respectfully acknowledge the history, customs, and culture of all Yukon First Nations for whom the land are an ancestral home, as well as Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas with roots in Beringia. Even though you may not see these folks on Zoom, they are working hard behind the scenes to make sure everything goes smoothly. From the Beringia Center side, we are joined off screen by Lance and Christy, and my colleagues from the Tar Pits team are Becca, Rocio, and Rachel. Together they, have been, they are organizing all those amazing questions you may have, and they make sure everything goes perfectly. So thank you. Before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit of what's going to happen today. We will be together for about 45 minutes, and to kick it off, we'll hear from our scientists, Grant and Reagan, and with the time remaining, we'll take all your questions. We'll try to get to as many, as questions, as many questions as we can, and our scientists may answer a lot of them during the presentation. But if we don't get to answer your question today, we encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about it on your own. So go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write about something that inspires you from the Ice Age. And we love fan art. So if you have a drawing or picture you'd like to share with us, ask your teacher or caregiver to email it to the school programs team, or post it on their social media account and tag us. And we'll share the social media information at the end of today's program. So Keisha, take it away and let's get started. So did you ask who Grant and Reagan might be? Well, hopefully I can answer those questions. With us today is Dr. Reagan Dunn, Associate Curator at the La Brea Tar Pits. Reagan is a paleobotanist whose research seeks to understand the interactions between climate, plants, and animal evolution throughout time. She studies phytoliths, pollen, leaf fossils, and wood to reconstruct ancient vegetation structure and composition. She has a PhD in biology from the University of Washington, a master's in botany from the University of Wyoming, and a bachelor in biological science from the Colorado State University. Her work at La Brea Tar Pits focuses on understanding vegetation and vegetation changes over the last 50,000 years in the Los Angeles Basin. We also have Dr. Grant Zazula. He is a Yukon paleontologist here at the Yukon Branch Interpretive Center. It was in 2006 when Grant moved to the Yukon to become our paleontologist. He got his PhD from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. His love for the Yukon all started when he traveled up here in 1999 for his thesis work, which focused on Arctic ground squirrels. He spent most of the summer working in a remote region outside the village of Old Crow in the traditional lands of the Vuntuk Gutchin First Nation. His passion lies in all things Ice Age, music, and of course, Beringia. Although he really loves Arctic ground squirrels, his favorite fossil mammal are the Ice Age camels. So now that you know who the scientists are, I'll pass the screens to them so we can learn about the Ice Age and how they use the knowledge to better understand current climate changes. Hello. Uh, Hello. Welcome. Hey. Hey, welcome. 
to our presentation today from two very different latitudes in climates. I'm Reagan Dunn, and I'm a curator at La Brea. I'm a paleobotanist. And uh, Grant, while our climates and countries are different from our, are different, our two museums have a lot in common. First, we have very unusual architectures on our buildings. Um, we both have woolly, or both have mammoths. Um, yours are woolly, I see, ours are not. Um, but we have in common that our museums have tremendous collections of Ice Age animals that tell us about Earth's past. That's right, Reagan. Well, thank you. This is a, an awesome opportunity to talk about Ice Age mammals because both the La Brea Tar Pits and the Yukon Beringia Interpretive Center have amazing things to see. We uh, at the at the Yukon Beringia Center, we have lots of uh, fossils of woolly mammoths and giant step bison and ancient horses, animals like that that lived in the Yukon during the Ice Age. We had mummified animals preserved in the permafrost. And it's a really interesting contrast to the amazing fossils that you have down at the La Brea Tar Pits, which include amazing, what, 400, 500, 5,000 dire wolves, saber-toothed cats, all kinds of cool things. And what's really interesting about these fossils is that they can tell us a lot about ancient climates. So if we're gonna talk about the ice age, of course we have to talk about ice. So let's have a look at this little video here. This is a map of North America showing a giant glacier that was covering most of Canada around 20,000 years ago. And as you see this video go through time, we're at 16,000 years ago, oh, 16,100 years, we're going forward in time. And as at the end of the ice age, as climate is warming up, the air temperatures are increasing and the ice is melting. And you can see that ice melting over Canada. And as that's happening, the sea level rises. So if you look in the far left-hand if you can see in the left-hand corner, you can see the Bering Strait that separates Asia from North America. And at the end of the Ice Age, that gets severed and flooded. So that connection between North America and uh, Asia is cut off. But we can also look at the right-hand side of our map here, and we can see a map of California. And what you probably didn't realize is that you had ice in California during the Ice Age. So there was massive glaciers covering the mountains in California. And because of all that, uh, all the uh, water being stored in glaciers, the sea level was reduced. So you can see the coastline of California was quite a bit different back uh, during the Ice Age. And because of all this ice and everything during the, uh, during the Ice Age, there was a lot of pronounced climate change. So we're really here today to talk about climate change. So during the ice age, we had massive changes in climates over the last two and a half million years. So it went back and forth between cold periods and warm periods and cold periods and warm periods all the time. But the key point is during the ice age, about 90% of the time was much colder than it is at present. And for us here living in the North, that's not a big deal because Winter's winter, it's always cold here. But in California, those changes are very pronounced. So how, one way to really understand how uh, climate changes our environment is through by looking at fossil plants. Okay, plants are really important in terrestrial ecosystems, ecosystems on land, they are everything. They are our habitat, um, they control the water cycle. They control greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and, the, and provide for carbon sinks. They control the soil temperature and soil moisture, which of course is really important in regulating fire regimes and erosion. And plant composition is, is controlled also by um, the plant structure and the climate. And also because plants are so pivotal on habitats, they are, they really form the habitat for animals and it sort of controls how plants or how animals make their living on the landscape. Plants are also the base of the food chains. So when you have some disruption to the base of the food chain, those impacts go down the rest of the chain and can have major um, uh, consequences for these other types of faunas. Plants are directly affected by climate. They don't move around much. 
Um, so plants have all kinds of adaptations that help them live in certain environments. You can think of deserts. Deserts have plants like cactus. They have adaptations to conserve water. Um, plants in tropical rainforest have those unique features. And so these adaptations preserve as fossils. And in that sense, fossil plants record ancient climates. That's so, right. <laughs> climate change. Ah, looking at climate change. Um, we know that climate has been changing for the last couple hundred years, and it's continuing to change at much higher rates. Um, in California, some of the major challenges that we face uh, involve precipitation and reduced rainfall. And so we're entering periods of very long droughts, um, which has, uh, has major implications for the fire cycles that we have. Um, fires are becoming more frequent. Our, our fire season has become much longer. We have an issue with water since we're a dry climate anyway. These warmer, drier climates mean that we have impacts in agriculture. Um, we have snow melting earlier in the mountains. We have um, sea level rising. Um, the deserts are beginning really hot, very extreme temperatures making it difficult for life. And of course, that excess carbon dioxide is increasing the acidity in the ocean, which affects um, invertebrate species like oysters. Grant, what's going on in the Arctic? Well, it's, if, it, if it looks bad down in California, it's equally as bad up here as well, because we're experiencing dramatic climate change. And in the Arctic, some of those changes are even more pronounced than they are in southern regions. So in places like Yukon, where I live, the, the temperatures are getting much warmer so and much, much wetter. So because of those warming temperatures, we're seeing a lot of our frozen ground, the permafrost melting, which is causing all kinds of disruptions in ecosystems. We're also seeing the sea ice. So, so ice that sits over the Arctic Ocean is now melting. So that has dramatic consequences for a lot of things like animals. So we hear about um, polar bears all the time. Where are polar, polar bears going to go in the Arctic if we have no sea ice? I don't know. We're also seeing a lot of other movements of animals because ecosystems are changing. So climate change is causing a lot of disruptions for the, the natural ecosystems, but also for people who live here as well. But if we're going to talk about climate change and talk about the Ice Age, we should probably talk a bit about what the Yukon looks like today, because I suspect a lot of you kids down in California have never been to the north before. So these are some images of what the Yukon looks like. So up north here, we live under snow for six months of the year. So the snow is just melting today. Uh, it's really nice and warm out today, but the snow is melting everywhere. And when it melts, we start seeing the emergence of the boreal forest. So we live within the boreal forest ecosystem, which is a vast landscape covered by trees and wetlands. And it's amazing because in the, in the, in the fall time, um, that, that, that wetland, those wetlands and those uh, forests turn beautiful colors. So you can see the, the tundra turning red here in the mountains. So this combination of forests and, and tundra ecosystems is home to lots of animals like caribou and moose and wolves and bears. But it wasn't always like that. Because when you look back during the last 50,000 years during the Ice Age, when it was extremely cold, the Yukon was a much different place because much of Canada was covered by ice, but parts of Yukon and Alaska were never covered by ice. And because of the depressed sea levels, we were connected to Asia in this landscape we know as Beringia. So I mentioned that the ground here is very cold in the Yukon and we call that ground permafrost. And that's ground and soil that is frozen throughout the year. So if you go in your backyard in Los Angeles and try to dig up your garden, you don't hit ice, but I do because it's frozen here. But that frozen ground is really important for the climate system, but it's also really important for paleontology because that frozen permanent ground is a window into the Ice Age that has all kinds of amazing remains from the Ice Age like Ice Age fossil bones. So if when we collect some of these fossil bones in the Yukon, uh, we have lots of animals like woolly mammoths and ancient horses. And one of the ways that we can try to understand what vegetation was like in the past to reconstruct with the plant communities that were living in places like the Yukon during the Ice Age is by looking at the teeth of ancient animals. So both these teeth here 
uh, of woolly mammoths and horses represent grazing animals. So that flat surface on the top represents a tooth that grinds grasses. And they're very different uh, than, than teeth of say people because we don't eat grass. So our teeth aren't flat like this. So if we look at the teeth of other types of large elephants, like mastodons. So we had two different types of elephants that lived in the Yukon during the ice age. We had mastodons and woolly mammoths. So on the left, you can see the tooth of a woolly mammoth, which has a really flat grinding surface for, uh, because it's a grazing animal. It eats tons of grass, but American mastodon teeth have big ridges or cusps on them, which are meant for breaking branches and eating small trees and shrubs. So those are browsers. So by looking at their teeth alone, that could tell us a lot about the types of vegetation those animals must have been eating. Therefore, the types of vegetation that were living on the landscape when those animals were alive. But sometimes in the permafrost, we can actually find remains of real ice age vegetation. So we don't actually have to infer what was growing in the past because what was growing in the past is actually frozen in the permafrost. So this is a wonderful example of the types of plants that were living beneath the feet of woolly mammoths 30,000 years ago in the ice age. So this is a chunk of somebody's back lawn, probably maybe a woolly mammoth's back lawn that was living 30,000 years ago. And you can see that some of that grass is still green because it was essentially deep frozen in the permafrost for 30,000 years. But there's other ways that we can reconstruct ancient vegetation as well in from uh, types of fossils that we find in the permafrost. And these are my favorite kinds of fossils to study. So these are Arctic ground squirrel. So if you ever saw that movie, Ice Age, the cartoon, you remember that guy, Scrat? Well, this is our Scrat from the Arctic. So these Arctic ground squirrels during the Ice Age were running around amongst the feet of woolly mammoths and collecting vegetation and taking it underground to store in their hibernation chambers because they have to sleep all winter. They hibernate. But in all those plants that were used as bedding for their nests have important records of what was living during the Ice Age. So you can see here some of these permafrost preserved nests that are 30,000 years old from the permafrost in Beringia. And these are remarkable ar archives of the types of plants that were living during the Ice Age. When we have these, when we look at these sites that we have lots of squirrel nests, we also sometimes find bones of Arctic ground squirrels. We also find tunnels. We find Little, uh, uh, little hibernation chambers that contain poop. So you can see the squirrel poop down here. We also sometimes find mummified Arctic ground squirrels that didn't survive. They, they went to sleep for hibernation in the winter, but they never woke up. So sometimes we find their whole bodies preserved in the permafrost as well. So when we pick apart these nests of Arctic ground squirrels from the permafrost, they have amazing records of the types of plants that were living here during the Ice Age. So we can pick apart seeds, fruits, uh, leaves, stems of all kinds of diverse types of plants that were living here. So these are a few examples of a few of these uh, different types of plants that we've been able to identify from these frozen nests of Arctic ground squirrels. So plants like poppies and chickweeds and all kinds of pretty little tundra flowers that were living amongst grasses. So we can reconstruct what this environment looks like by based on all these plant species telling us it was a it was a treeless open tundra grassland that supported woolly mammoths during the ice age. We can also look at fossil beetles because beetles have very very narrow climate windows they can live in. So if temperatures change the beetles have to move. So when we pull beetle fossils out of the permafrost, it can give us a really good indication of what the climate was like at that time. So when we look at the beetles from Yukon during the height of the last ice age, it was almost six degrees colder here during the ice age. Can you imagine that? It is so cold here in the winter already. So making it six degrees colder, it was truly, truly an extremely cold environment that these animals lived in in the north during the ice age. So when we put all this evidence together from Arctic ground squirrel nests, fossil animals like woolly mammoths and beetles and other plant fragments, we can look at this ancient landscape of Beringia. Remember today, this is an environment covered by boreal forest and ponds and swamps. 
But now we know that this environment is a treeless grassland that supported a huge diversity of large grazing animals during the Ice Age. Wow, but, thank you, Grant. That is fascinating. Um, uh, I think one thing that we understand down here in California is that what happens in Yukon and the Arctic doesn't stay up north. Um, so what happens in California is that as the ice is melting up north, so over here on the right, here's some, some climate models that show where the ice caps we were here in blue and green. The red and yellow colors are a record of temperature. So these climate models start about 20,000 years ago to 16,000 years ago to 13 to 12 to the present day. So what you see is as the ice is melting, our temperatures in California stay pretty stable, but what happens as a result of that ice melting is that the storm systems change and that controls how much precipitation we get in this area. So when the, there's times when the storm tracks um, avoid us altogether and it makes our California, Southern California, very dry. So you can see this dust storm here from Lake Owens. This is during one of those very dry periods. So looking at our vegetation compared to vegetation up north in, in Beringia, we're quite a bit different. So all you folks up in, up in Yukon um, might not have ever been to California, but we have a very different climate. We have uh, what's called the Mediterranean climate. So we have a lot of different types of floras because we have such a diverse topography. So we have lowlands down by the coast that are dominated by these coastal sage scrubs. Um, these light blue colors in and around the Los Angeles and the hills are chaparral vegetation. So these are dry adapted um, shrub and short tree stature types of vegetation. We also have oak woodlands um, and up higher elevations, uh, closer towards the mountains, we have these mixed conifer forests that consist of pines and junipers. And then of course, out in the deserts like the Mojave, we have um, this desert vegetation like these Joshua trees here. Because it's so warm many times of the year and because we have such a, a, a great diverse landscape with which includes um, climate, um, gradients, we have an extremely rich vegetation. And it's in fact, one of the hot spots for biodiversity. And it's called the California Floristic Province. We have about 6,500 native plant species in this province. So it's an extremely important region today. Of course, our deposits at Rancho La Brea um, record some of this history and to contrast your ice age ecosystems, you can see um, Los Angeles and the Hollywood Hills back in the, in the background, but the Los Angeles basin has been a really important reservoir for oil for, um, for many years. And you can see all the oil derricks, those aren't there anymore, but the oil still percolates to the surface and plants and animals and insects get stuck in that ticky, sticky tar and uh, they've just been waiting for us to excavate them over the years. So what were the tar pits like during the ice ages? Well, we know from all those animal bones that this area supported a very diverse fauna with over 230 species of vertebrates found. It's really the best site known for the extinct Pleistocene megafauna. Um, those are big animals over 45 kilograms or 100 pounds. And you can see a lot of examples here. Our deposits are really rich in carnivores. Carnivores, um, I don't know why they got stuck so often. I, they just must have traveled in packs and um, really were just <laughs> too attracted to the methane and the tar seeps and the, the rotting carcasses of herbivores in there. And we have a growing list of plants. Um, we only have 55 different species recorded in our collections now, but we have hundreds of thousands of specimens that have yet to be studied. So the plant deposits have really kind of been ignored at the tar pits. So this list is gonna grow. What we do know is that the most common plant fossils we find are those junipers and oaks and sunflowers and pines. So we think these, these habitats were kind of a closed juniper forest at times and at other times chaparral. We, um, 
We also know something about plants from digging out plant remains from some of the vertebrate remains. So here's a bison tooth and there's this little um, hole in the bison tooth, but these were packed with the original vegetation that these animals ate. So when some scientists in the 1980s picked those little bits of vegetation out and looked at them under the microscope, they were able to identify them and say something about animal diets. And so it looks like here, the bison, they were eating mostly woody vegetation shown in green here. Same with the camels. Um, they were eating just a little bit of grass, just a little bit of grass for the camels, but the horses are eating more grass. So there are more traditional grazers. We also know something about animal diets and also climate from by looking at carbon isotopes from mammal teeth. And so here's a camel tooth that has been sampled here. Uh, those samples get analyzed with big fancy machines and say something about the environment. Um, sometimes if you have your isotope values over in this part of the world, you are living, looking at more wetter and more forested communities. And then if you're on this side of the graph over here, the yellow part, those are more dry and arid conditions. So our fossils at La Brea fall into this range right here. But of course, the best way to look at the ancient plants of La Brea is to look at the actual plants themselves. So here's just a couple examples of the extraordinary preservation that we get. These came out of the ground just sticky and full of asphalt, but once we clean them all up, you can see how well they're preserved. So we also have a scrat. This is our version of scrat. It's a, it's a different, different kind of rodent. This is a, a bushy-tailed wood rat or a pack rat. And they're quite a nuisance because they can get into cars and houses. And, but you can see they collect all that vegetation and have these great little archives of the, ancient, of the vegetation that was around. And so here's what that looks like covered in asphalt. You can see all the different things that are preserved in there. You can take these coprolites and look at them under a, a, a scanning electron microscope and see what this little guy was eating. So he was eating um, oak leaf right here, some a little juniper foliage here, um, some tree roots over here. So these little animals uh, can give us, give us a good idea of ancient environments as well. Okay, one thing too that people don't think about are the teeniest, tiniest of fossils. And these are microfossils. Um, and we get these from our asphaltic sediments. We remove the asphalt and it just looks like a pile of dirt here, nothing interesting, nothing to see. But if you put that onto a microscope slide and look at it under magnification, you find all kinds of things like pollen phytoliths and leaf cuticles. So here's some examples of the pollen that we find at the tar pits. These pollen types tell us what kinds of plants grew here and how many of them grew here for so, lo so long ago. These things are called phytoliths or plant silica. And these are little particles of silica that grow in plant tissues, but when they are found in the tar, they're just these little isolated pieces. And so they tell us about the kinds of grasses that grew at the tar pit so long ago in the past. And they're quite little, beautiful, tiny little things you could put one of, you could put four of these across one strand of hair. That's how they're small they are. And then we can also look at the surface of little tiny leaf fragments and look at all these cells on the, the skin of the leaf. And by measuring these, we can learn something about how the forest was structured. Was it open or closed? And then we can also learn about ancient um, atmospheric CO2 levels. What were they like? Because we know that's changed a lot in the past and has changed a lot um, in the recent future. So let's say a little something about carbon dioxide because it's such a potent atmospheric gas that controls our earth system. And so here is a, a record from this ice core here in Antarctica. And so scientists can measure isotopes to get the temperature values of these ancient environments that would go as far back as uh, 1 million years now. This record just starts here at 140,000 years ago. And then they can look at the air bubbles preserved in these ice cores and measure carbon dioxide. And so you can see that carbon dioxide and temperature really go together. Carbon dioxide controls um, temperature. So this is at the end of the uh, kind of the end of our warm period. And this 
is these, these sort of pre-industrial, before the combustion engine, carbon dioxide levels were about 280. And so you can see in this very short time frame how quickly CO2 is rising. Today, we're about 420 parts per million. So we've doubled CO2 just in the last um, short time. We can also get paleoclimate from beetles at the tar pits like you guys have too. So if we take all of that information and summarize it, we find that um, the tar pits climate was slightly cooler, just a little bit, and wetter during the last ice age, um, but there were times of intense drought. And during those times of intense drought, the plant species changed. We went from a closed juniper forest to the chaparral vegetation that we have today, that's fire adapted vegetation. And we know there was a lot of grass at the tar pits, but not that many animals ate it for some reason. Um, one thing we haven't looked at yet, which I'm dying to, is that we have really great fossil wood. And as you guys are aware, that trees grow, put on a new growth ring every year. And that growth ring can tell us, those growth rings can tell us about um, the ancient climate by, it can tell us what the growing season conditions were during those years. And so we can look at it during those times of drought um, or when the times were good or when CO2 was low. Now Grant, do you guys have fossil wood too? Yes, we do. And we, but our fossil wood only dates to the brief warm periods of the ice age. So around 125,000 years ago, the earth experienced a massive period of global warming. And in places like Yukon and Alaska, temperatures got very warm and we experienced forests. So um, all the evidence that I talked to you about the ice age showing that it was an open treeless grassland is very different when we look at time periods like this because it shows that we also had ancient forests in the Yukon. But we also know based on other types of uh, evidence from that time period, um, um, things like beetles, it tells us that the temperatures were even warmer than they are today. So we had um, forests all the way to the Arctic coastline 125,000 years ago. And that's a really important lesson for us as paleontologists because it gives us some ideas, some hints, some forecasting of what may happen in the future with global warming scenarios in the Arctic. Another thing that is important to understand about the records that we have at the tar pits is that there was this big extinction at the end of the last glaciation um, in which 75% of the world's large land mammals went extinct. Um, the Brea is a really important place for this because we have so many individuals of animals that can be radiocarbon dated so we can know when this extinction happened. And then because we have this record of plants we can try to understand what the cause of this extinction was. Was it climate change? Was it overhunting by humans or some combination of the two? Um, so that extinction event happens right here. So you can see there were many warm periods and uh, warm periods and cold periods throughout the last um, two million years, but something about this last one was different. So it's going to be really interesting to learn more about that. So I'd love to um, open it up for questions from, from the, all the, our listeners. Yay, please do, please, uh, please ask us questions. Awesome, so we have, uh, our first question goes out to both of you and it comes from Shri and they're asking, how do you know what the climate was in the past while studying fossils? Do you want to start with that one, Reagan? You bet. Um, well, there weren't thermometers around, right? But we use plants as thermometers in many cases. So we can know what kinds of species lived to where they live today. We know the climate in which they live in. And so we can use our knowledge of what lives today to sort of uh, reconstruct or predict what the temperatures were in the past. Another thing we can do is that we can look at the, the shapes and sizes of leaves and because leaves and the adaptations that they have are um, correspond to the climate. So leaves with um, toothy margins, serrated margins grow in cooler climates than those with smooth margins like in the tropics. So there's lots of different ways, but those are just a few. 
Yeah, that's that's exactly it, Reagan. And in a place like Yukon, we can look at the plant fossils as well, because we know that trees can only grow when it's warm. But when it's cold in places like the tundra, there are no trees because it's too cold. So if we have fossil evidence of treeless conditions during the past, it can tell us that it's much colder in the past because there was no trees growing there because it was too cold for them. So trees, plants are our thermometers. They are. And, our and beetles. And, yeah. we, we, and we did talk about beetles as well. And beetles and other types of insects provide very... Um, very accurate or very precise uh, measurements for temperature because we know that most insects can only live in a very narrow range of temperatures. So if we find their fossils in a particular place, it tells us that's what the temperature was in the past. So the past is the key to the present and the present is the key to the past. That's great. And sometimes it's those little things, right? The microfossils that give us the bigger picture, not just those expensive fossils. Um, Reagan, I have a question for you from Christopher. He's asking if you can comment on how you remove the asphalt in order to observe the microfossils in the resultant soil samples. Yes, excellent. We use um, solvents that will dissolve any of the petrochemicals. And so those are, we use a solvent that's used to clean grease off of airplane parts. Um, so it's it's very effective. So we, we use that, we soak the sediments in that solution and then the asphalt um, goes into the solution and then we're left with just the sediment, which is our goal. Really cool. Uh, Grant, so the next question uh, is from Aiden. And um, do you know how long a woolly mammoth lives compared to the relative elephant? Hey, that's a, that's a really good question. And we know that woolly mammoths are most closely related to uh, Asian elephants. And in the Yukon, we had woolly mammoths, which were cousins of the Colombian mammoths that lived down in California, that the Libre Tar Pits. And probably the biggest difference is uh, the, the Colombian mammoths in California were much larger and probably had much less hair than the, the smaller sized woolly mammoths up north. But um, we presume when we look at their teeth, because a woolly mammoth or a, an elephant of any sort goes through six sets of teeth in their life. So they have two teeth on the bottom, two teeth up top, and they grind. They're constantly eating grasses and plants, and those teeth get ground down. So they constantly are losing teeth. So they go through six sets in their life. And if we can look at using an Asian elephant as an estimate for how long a, a mammoth lived, we figure they can live to about 65 years of age. So they get really, really old, and they go through six sets of teeth during those 65 years. So uh, if they run, uh, they grind down their teeth, they can get a new one. Not like us. Once we're adults and we, we, uh, we lose our teeth, that's about it. We have to get dentures. <laughs> that's true. Um, I want to go back to the beetles that you mentioned for a little bit, maybe for both of you. Alexis is wondering if beetle shells, shells preserve better than beetle bodies. And is it different um, if they're preserved in asphalt or preserved in frost? Well, I can say, I know like um, in, our, in our areas that we work in, in Alaska and Yukon, the beetles are very well preserved. And, and actually the exoskeletons of all these beetles are, they're made out of a, a very hard substance. It's almost like a fingernail type substance and it preserves very well in the ground. So uh, yes, uh, the soft parts of beetles don't get preserved, but it's their hard exterior, exo, exterior exoskeleton that preserves. And in, and in most places, in places like permafrost in the Arctic, or in the asphalt of La Brea, they preserve very, very well. So they're actually a very, very useful kind of fossil for studying ancient climates. And they can be, be found almost in any type of uh, sediment or uh, site in the world. Yes, and that the asphalt preserves those exoskeletons very well. Asphalt doesn't preserve any of the soft tissue. So we don't have any of the mummified things that you guys have, which are yes. so cool. Um, but we, uh, for some reason, the asphalt degrades soft tissue, anything like hair um, or nails, but we do get that chitin, the insect exoskeletons preserved. So this next question kind of ties into that as well. Um, do the bones of animals vary based on the climate and the environment in which they lived? And that's from Carthacan. 
Well, yeah, they do vary quite a bit, uh, just in terms of their preservation, as, as Reagan mentioned, in, in places like the permafrost, if an animal dies in the permafrost and gets buried very quickly, so let's say an animal dies and then a mudslide happens and that animal becomes buried, its whole body can get preserved. So we can get preserved skin and hair and muscle tissue that's preserved in permafrost. It's almost like a deep freeze. If you open up your deep freeze, you can find some old hamburgers sitting there because they've been sitting there frozen. That's what happens to some of our animals. And because of that deep frozen preservation, we can, uh, we can extract things like DNA from those bones. So our bones still have fat and grease and protein and DNA preserved in them. And that's very, very different than the La Brea Tar Pits, where a lot of those biological components of bones have been uh, leached out of the bone itself. So maybe you could tell us a bit about more of that, uh, Reagan. Yeah, sure. We have, of course, been trying very hard to get DNA. We haven't been successful yet, but maybe some new methods will help. One thing that tells us about climate preserved in the animal bones and teeth are those isotopes. So we can look mm -hmm. at isotopes of oxygen and carbon, and they can tell us about climate. Um, you can also look at histology, bone histology. So if you took a bone and you cut it in half and um, sanded it down and looked at a microscope, uh, you could see different patterns of growth. And so that can tell you something about the seasonality of growth for these animals um, and also their, um, their age, if they're adults or juveniles. Uh, also the, the teeth can tell you something about the seasonality. If there's a, a pronounced dry season, you can see different, different um, rings in the enamel structures as well. So you can get climate information and also uh, body size. So body mass is often associated with climate because larger animals tend to live in colder climates and smaller animals tend to live in, in warmer climates. And we also have a lot of differences in the types of animals that are preserved in the La Brea tar pits versus those that are preserved in, in places like Alaska and Yukon where uh, most of the bones you find in California at the tar pits are carnivores like saber tooth cats and dire wolves. But those are two animals that didn't live in the Arctic of North America. So we don't have saber tooth cats or dire wolves. We had lions and we had something called a scimitar cat, which is a cousin of the saber tooth cat. We also had big woolly mammoths and big woolly bison and horses. So those are the types of animals, more Arctic adapted animals than were found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Great, thank you. Um, oh, I hate that we're almost running out of time. We have so many questions here from so many of our students. Um, maybe we'll end on actually, I don't know, there's so many, I don't know what to ask. Um, maybe we can end on Something about the work that you both do, maybe um, why you got interested in studying the Ice Age or plants in particular, animals in particular, and um, what would you, what advice would you give to um, a young scientist who's interested in doing the work that you both do? Sure, I'll start. Um, I, I come from a long line of farmers, so I think that has sort of instilled a plant uh, focus in me. And I think that plants are such a great way to look at the environment. So that's why I like plants. I mean, I like animals and they're really cool and they move around and they do stuff and plants don't so much, but plants really do record those climates. And so I'm interested in those sort of big picture questions. And um, I think it's just, how did I go into this? I, I don't know. It just was, I followed my heart and my passions and um, I, I just did that and had the, uh, the support to be able to do that. And um, you just have to ask the questions. And, and if you have a job where you can do what you're passionate about, then I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm very similar to Reagan. I, I spent summers uh, baling hay on a farm at my grandparents as well. And I was always interested in the connections between plants and animals and the land. And for me, the Ice Age is such, provides such a remarkable opportunity to think about change because with the Ice Age, although it's the recent geological past, it was only yesterday. It was only a few thousand years ago. And in the, in the whole context of Earth history, it's almost, you know, just like yesterday. So when we think of the changes that have happened in, since the Ice Age, 
with to go from a landscape where there's giant glaciers covering the continent with woolly mammoths and lions and saber cats running around to only a few thousand years later to having uh, and uh, the city of Los Angeles. That's a remarkable amount of change has happened in only a few thousand years. And I, and I think seeing those changes in the fossil record is really amazing and a really pri- uh, I feel very privileged to study this stuff. And, um, and, I, and I love the opportunity to help us learn about those changes so we can try to be better prepared for what may happen in the future. Well, that was I should great. have added that part <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Grant and Reagan. And uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us this afternoon. We've learned so much about the Ice Age and how we can use this knowledge to better understand current climate change. Uh, if you want to see more from the Yukon Bridge at a Trifford of Center, add us on Facebook um, and or add us on Instagram. So you can see our hashtags on below there. And you can also follow the work we do at Libria Tar Pits on Instagram. Our handle is at the Libria Tar Pits. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com forward slash the Libria Tar Pits. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Grant and Regan. That was fascinating. We had so many questions that we wanted to get to, but again, students, if you want to submit your questions, um, your teacher caregiver can email us at school programs and we can hopefully pass them along or you can do your own research. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you again next week on April 28th at 1 p.m. for our third and final installment um, where we'll hear from Dr. Grant Sazula again and Dr. Myrene Belisi, postdoctoral research fellow at Libera Tarpets, as they discuss how we study the fossils found at each site and what questions we're still asking about the Ice Age. And for those joining us on Zoom, we've got one more question for you all that's posting now. And thank you and see you all next week. Thank you.